worship him in word, we want to open up the word to Romans chapter 8. As we've been going through the book of Romans, chapters 1 all the way up through 8, verse 17, here are some of the things that we've learned or been discovering from God. Up to this point, we studied the gospel of Jesus Christ, the very mission of why Paul wrote the book of Romans. God's righteousness and that God is holy. Mankind's sinfulness and depravity. God's judgment against sin is wrath. Our justification, reconciliation, forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. Sinners saved by God's grace. Hope in God, the hope of God. Sanctification in Christ. Growing in Christ and victory over sin. Paul's testimony, life in Christ, a life in the Holy Spirit. So these are concepts, ideas, realities of who God is in relationship to us, realities of who we are in our depravity and sin, and our relationship to Christ in in Christ in God. And so that's that's taken us a lot, a big journey in our in our walk with God. So we're going to pause a little bit today and we're going to focus on God, the Holy Spirit. We're going to focus a lot on who he is, because up to this point, we have been introduced in Romans to God, the father and God, the son. And then Paul starts mentioning the spirit in Romans eight, but he doesn't go deeply into him into who he is. So we're going to take a little time and look at who he is, the Holy Spirit. Take a pause and look. We've learned a lot about Abba Father. We've learned a lot about Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. But we haven't learned a lot deeply in the book of Romans. You may have on your own, in your own experience with him. But as we look through the book of Romans, he doesn't go real deep into who the Holy Spirit is. So one thing we'll learn is that God's spirit does not try to bring attention to himself. That's one big warning signal for those who seek to exalt the Holy Spirit instead of exalting Christ. It's a good, the, what I call the red flags start popping up and the, and the sirens and the alarm bells start going off when I hear folks rarely speak about Jesus maybe talk a lot about the Father, but really, really emphasize the Holy Spirit. So today what we're going to do is look at some scripture that relates to this. So in Romans, Paul starts really focusing on the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8, verses really 12 and onward, but we're going to focus on 14 through 16 today. Paul says this, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God... These are children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again, leading to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the disciple of Christ, who is truly born again in Christ, never needs to doubt that he or she is saved, born again. The doubts aren't there. doesn't mean that maybe I'm doubting that I'm in the will of God or doing what I'm supposed to do. Of course, those kinds of things might happen. But to, to genuinely doubt or to doubt my genuineness in Christ, my, my eternity in Christ, that I'm going to heaven, I'm going to be with God forever. God says right here that his spirit, the real living spirit of the living God in me, in you, if you're truly born again, he bears witness. That means he's speaking. He is bearing witness. There's words. There's mentioning. There is communication that you are truly a child of God. We, we have no need for doubting this. And so Paul really focuses in on this of our inheritance, our heritage in Christ. We are truly born again. If we're truly born again, then we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and he bears witness. So first thing that we want, we are confronted with in Scripture is this. The Holy Spirit is not a force. 
or just an essence of the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is not an it either, although sometimes he acts like an it, like water and, and such. But he is still who he is, a divine person. That is the divine person of the Trinity, and we'll talk about this. So we see Jesus reaffirms the deity of the Holy Spirit, the personhood of the Holy Spirit, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And we see this, that he talks about to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus himself teaches the uniqueness of the triune nature of who God is. Within the entirety of who God is and what he is, and, and we got to get away from the idea that part of God is the Holy Spirit. Part of God, that, that doesn't even make sense within who God is. And that, that just makes your brain explode even trying to explain this. So the reality of who God is, is that within who he is, he is Father, he is Son, he is Holy Spirit. And that's about as far as we can go with our human brains. We must accept this triune nature of who God is. One person of who God is, is the Holy Spirit. God is not wearing masks. It is real of what we're talking about, the reality of what we're talking about here. So this is a perfect illustration. We are not talking about three different gods, but we are talking about three divine persons who are within the very being makeup. And that's about as close as I can come to the reality of what Scripture says. Within who God is, the triune Godhead. And God is never called they or them by any creature that is created by God. Does that make sense? God may say, let us make man in our image. Or when God speaks to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he says, we have borne witness, and he's talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here. But God never refers to himself as they, in the sense of creatures should call us they or them. You never find in Holy Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, that a creature would refer to the triune Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they are worthy of worship. You never hear that. Ever. I hear people from the pulpit say that. I hear people in conversation who are Christians. Now, I'm not saying that, oh, no, they're going to hell because of that. But I'm saying they misunderstand and don't see a pattern in Scripture of precedence of anybody who is a Christian or a follower of God in the Old Testament. No one ever looks to God and say it or they or them. They specifically talk about the Father the Word of God or the Son of God, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, folks, never speak about God as they. Never is it recorded in Scripture. So how is God the Holy Spirit symbolized in the Old and New Testament? Sim symbolically, he is likened unto water, wind, fire, oil, and light. And I will leave it to you to look those scriptures up because they're rampantly all over the Old and New Testament. But he is symbolized. That doesn't mean that he is water. That doesn't mean that he is wind, that he is fire, that he is oil. But those substances are symbolic of something about who the Holy Spirit is. Now, it's very interesting to note that the scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, which are inspired actively by the Holy Spirit moving in holy men of old, 2 Peter chapter 1, that the scriptures are looked upon as water and light. A couple of the symbols that are symbolic of the nature of who the Holy Spirit is. So the essence, the imprint, the impact of the Holy Spirit in scripture is seen that, that the bride in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 and on, that the bride is to be 
washed and renewed by the water of the word of God, not by the water of the traditions of Rome, not by the water of traditions of Hollywood, but the water of the word of God. And so the bride of Christ is washed and cleansed. We see the washing and renewing uh, and the baptizing of the Holy Spirit. All of those kinds of symbols are there that relate to water and cleansing. Wind, and we know that the, the, when the wind blows, we can see the effects, Jesus says, but we don't know where it's going. In the same way, so is a person who is born of the Spirit, who is born again in John chapter 3. Oil, anointing oil. When uh, Aaron was anointed with oil, that was a symbol of being anointed with the Holy Spirit in that office. And the same with the king. The king was also anointed with oil. So we see all of these kinds of symbols relate to what he does and who he is and how he impacts and engages his creation. How God does what he does through his Holy Spirit. Here are some names, some various names. And these are not all the names of the Holy Spirit within Scripture. God's Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Holiness, the Spirit of the Father, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Truth, the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Life, the Spirit of God, Glory, Eternal Spirit, the Comforter or Counselor or Advocate. The Greek word is paraclete or parakletos, one who comes alongside to help. These symbols and various names tell us more about who he is and what his mission is. Okay, So what his mission is, who he is. We are first introduced to the Holy Spirit in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, see the symbol of water there. And then we know that God uses his Spirit to bring life. He uses his Spirit, God the Father, when he speaks Always his son is there. So he speaks or conveys, God the Father conveys through the word of God, the living word of God, and who we know now is Jesus Christ. God the Father spoke creation into existence by his spirit. Every person of the triune Godhead is involved within everything that relates to creation and redemption. It isn't just God the Father doing something. God the Father through his Son by his Spirit. God the Father through his Word by his Spirit. And in that same way, God does the same thing in us all the way through the consummation of the end. Isn't that awesome? To think that all of who God is in every dimension and person, personhood of who he is Oh, God, forgive me if I'm even coming short of, uh, and not even explaining the glory of who you are, God. I, I'm touching upon the holy here. This is like I should take off my shoes. This is holy ground. Remember, his name is Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He is holy. Mm. He is holy. We talked earlier about the Shekinah glory being in at the temple or the tabernacle and the glory of God. It, the Shekinah glory is the essence, the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. And we know now in Christ, we have that in us, that manifest presence, we have him in us. And we know this in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. This was a hint. This is what Jesus referred to in John chapter 3, when he was talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus thought, well, can I crawl back up into my mom and be born again? And Jesus says, what? You are the teacher of Israel, and you don't know these things? This has been prophesied. When the new covenant comes, basically he's saying this. He's almost slapping him across the face, saying this. When the Messiah comes and brings a new covenant, he is going to fulfill Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33, but he's also going to do the parallel part of that passage, which is this passage, Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, see, clean water on you, and you will be clean, and I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, from all your idols, and I will give you a new heart 
and a new spirit within you, new creation. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And that isn't the heart of flesh of the old sinful nature flesh. This is pliable. This is brand new. It's living compared to dead. That's what he's trying to do here. Compare and contrast. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. So in the new covenant, the new law, with a new creation, I am a new creation with a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit within me. I am a brand new person in Christ, in the, in the Messiah. This is what he's talking about here. When Jesus said, you must be born again, when you are born again, this is what happens. This is what Jesus does inside you. This is amazing to know that the change of heart and mind occurs. It doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means you are brand new. It is, it is not like I accepted a tenant of faith like other people do when they like sign the dotted line and have a covenant. This is a life transformational covenant impact with the living life of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is also called the Spirit of life. So he is more powerful than sin, and he gives you a brand new life. So what we see here is that God's Holy Spirit causes sinners to be born again. He is outside of the sinner first, comes alongside the sinner, convicts the sinner, and brings the sinner to the cross. I know in my life, in my own testimony, it is very similar to the testimony of the Apostle Paul. In this sense, I was raised in a Christian home. I was in, in a situation where I was trying to follow the law, being good. I couldn't do it. That which was revealed to me was like the law, and I could not do it. And I kept failing, and then I said, the heck with it. I'm not going to do it anymore, and went off into atheism. And then God came along and showed me where my life was heading. My life was heading to the place of the lake of fire. God showed me very clearly the law of God against my life the verdict was lake of fire. Now, everything in my dream, I did not write a book about my dream that brought me to Christ. I could have written a, a book about everything that was in the dream, but not everything in the dream was something that I could say, well, now really angels are, look like this, and creatures look like this, and the lake of fire looks like this, and that's the way it is. It might contradict what Scripture is. Does that make sense? My experience was designed for me to bring me to the cross, was designed for me to wake me up, to make me look to Jesus for my salvation, that I could not do anything on my own. I could not save myself. I was bound in sin, going to be bound in sin and thrown in the lake of fire because of my sin. Not only the sin that I inherited from Adam and Eve, but the sin that I did in my own life was enough to send me to hell. Even if I never sinned, it would be enough to send me to hell because I was a sinner. I was bound by sin, and the lake of fire was my destiny. Now, when I woke up and gave my life to Christ, that was what the Holy Spirit intended for me. The Holy Spirit intended for me to hear the gospel and to believe and trust in Christ for my salvation and at that point is when the Holy Spirit came into me. The Holy Spirit was never inside of me before then. He was working on me to bring me to the place, convicting me of my sin. And we see this in Ephesians 1, verses 13 through 14, and then we'll look at Ephesians 4, 30 here. It says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. In my dream I heard the word of truth. In my life prior to the dream, I heard the gospel. I heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Remember, Jesus purchased me, purchased you, to the praise of his glory, and he seals that with the Holy Spirit in our lives. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed unto the day of redemption. God's Spirit stays in you. He is in you all the way to the point where you are before the throne of God. And you are there before Jesus. 
So what I'm saying here is that I repented of my sins and came to Christ. But it was the Holy Spirit himself who was moving in my life through people, through circumstances, through all kinds of situations to bring me to that place where I would come to the cross. And there are people who resist the Holy Spirit, who, who resist his promptings. And, and there is a point at which God will allow those folks to go to the lake of fire because they have resisted the Holy Spirit and in essence have blasphemed the Holy Spirit to the point which that is unforgivable, Jesus said. To think that the Holy Spirit who is in Jesus Christ was really of the devil. I mean, that's about what you're saying. If you are all your life resisting the Holy Spirit's prompting for you to bow the knee in your heart to Christ, I mean, you, that's a lot of resistance. When the Holy Spirit is working on a person, there are all kinds of people who will be in hell who will be thinking, wow, I could have. I had all these opportunities, X, Y, Z. You know, all these opportunities to come to Christ. The fire of hell won't be hot enough for the regrets that people have because they did not turn to Christ. And when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, this is John chapter 16, verse 8 through 11, when he, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin. That means the world of people. He doesn't leave anybody out here. He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And here's, he's going to unpack what that means. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. We are born not believers. We are not born believers. I hear it all the time. I was raised in the church. I was raised in a Christian family. No, you have to come to a place where you understand that you have made a, de a decision, a real stark decision, where that was when, now you may not remember when that was, but there had to be a day where you did. Because if you didn't, you didn't. You didn't just osmosis. There had to be a day where you said, Jesus, you are my Lord, King, God, and Savior, and I will serve you. I am a sinner. I repent. Even a little kid, a little kid will recognize that they've sinned and, or have sinful tendencies if they come to Christ. Because if they're confronted with God's righteousness, which God talks about here, they will, will have to admit they're a sinner or think that God is a liar. That's the only choices. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. That means God sent Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh. That's really what he's saying here. Jesus is God in the flesh. He, his, his messianic mission of what he did, doing good, all that he did, all the miracles, going to the cross, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, all of that. He talks about the ascension here, and he goes back to the Father. The full redemptive work of Jesus was real. It was real. It did not, it did not happen in some comic book. It was a real event of judgment because the ruler of this world, Satan, is judged. And there's a word there that is judged. is like is judged or has been judged already. And we know when he was judged, the judgment was pronounced in the garden in Genesis 3. The Nahash, the evil one, that's what it means, serpent, the evil one. Now look, Satan is not a serpent. Satan is also not a dragon, but he is symbolized as a dragon. Just like the Holy Spirit is not water. Just like Jesus is not a lamb. See, these are symbol, symbolic words and, and, and sayings. At one point, Jesus said, tell that fox, Herod, that I have to go to Jerusalem. He looked at Herod as a sly fox. So in the same way, God is pronouncing judgment upon this angelic being who was talking to Adam and Eve in the garden as if he was a lowly snake. And he's likening him, this glorious being, what shame this is, to liken him as cattle. And to be even worse than cattle, to, to be on his... So that is the symbol, symbolic usage here. You have to go back in time, and when was he judged? Well, I know when the judgment occurred, it occurred in the garden. 
And that was Satan there, not some demon-possessed snake that had legs and could talk. It was Satan himself. And we know this in Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 20. It says, that old serpent, the devil, the dragon. So we know that was Satan himself there. So Satan was judged. Now, why is this important? Because we as sinners are in the same category as Satan because we are rebellious. Satan was judged right along with Adam and Eve. That was the judgment that was pronounced. So we are in the same category. Our fate is the lake of fire, which God says in, in Matthew 25 that he created that for the devil and his angels. So the very judgment that Satan had is the same judgment we have because we, as, as human sinners, we follow the ruler who is Satan. Does that make sense? So he's likening this unto them. So the Holy Spirit's work is to do this. And he does this through the word of God preached. He never does this divorced from his word. So when the word of God is preached, even for the wrong reasons, when it is preached, the Holy Spirit is there. He is doing his work. Paul says that in Philippians. So God the Holy Spirit causes the sinner to be born again. That is, prior to... To me coming to Christ, he was with the sinner, walking alongside. Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world, Satan, will be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples unto myself. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to lift up Jesus. To lift up Jesus. The Holy Spirit's work is to work in our lives work through his word being preached so that Jesus is lifted up. When he is exalted, then all people will be drawn to Jesus. When Jesus is the focus, the Holy Spirit's work is to work in our lives to lift up Jesus, not to lift up the Holy Spirit. He is not in the, in the business of focusing on himself. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7 says more about the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. When the kindness, but when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How did he save us? Through, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. It's almost a parallel with what Paul was talking about in Romans 8, that our inheritance by the Holy Spirit applied to us, we are children of God, all of those symbols are there. So let's, let's talk about something here. When a person comes to Christ, when a person comes to Christ, the very first thing that they do is usually pray to God. They cry out to God, God, forgive me, be merciful to me, a sinner. I mean, whatever they, however they cry out, they're reaching out to trust in God. Part of the faith, the trust that we do, the very first thing we do is cry out to him. It isn't just a mental thing. We speak it. We, we cry out to him. But never do we find in all of Scripture anybody ever praying to the Holy Spirit directly. Interesting, huh? Nobody's ever praising him. Oh, I praise you, Holy Spirit. Doesn't mean that we can't. But we have no pattern. We have no precedence. We have no example. We have no uh, commands, no precepts, principles, or patterns, the three P's, precepts, which are commands, pattern, I mean, the principles, which we have these principal concepts and ideas, nor do we have patterns of any uh, follower of God in Old or New Testament praying to the Holy Spirit directly. Just wanted to bring that up. It's kind of like file that under, did you know? And the reason why is because we as creations, as redeemed <coughs> Uh, we probably want to follow what God has set. So we see a normal pattern of this. Christians, followers of God, 
Pray to God the Father in the name of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, or by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And the leading of the Holy Spirit leads us based upon the Word of God, which the Holy Spirit inspired and illumined for us. So we see teaching about that, that way. In fact, there are some who will pray to Jesus, like Stephen. Jesus, receive my spirit. But we don't see anybody really praying to the Holy Spirit. I haven't found that. The Holy Spirit speaks. Now this is to shore up that he is person. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So God the Spirit, he does speak. And we see that in Acts 13 where he spoke and said, I choose Barnabas and Saul for the mission that I have for them. Set them apart. I've set them apart. So he spoke and they heard. He spoke. God the Holy Spirit is like the CEO. Now again, I'm, I'm using simile here. But he's like the CEO over the church overall, over the mission of the church. And the mission's thrust is to get out the message of Jesus. So God, the Holy Spirit, moves upon the church and fills the church with his energy to get out the message of the gospel of Christ, not the gospel of the Holy Spirit. The gospel of Christ. And then we just think about the Bible itself. Genesis to Revelation is the Holy Spirit speaking on behalf of Christ because of the Father speaking through the Son by the Holy Spirit. So we see that he does speak and he speaks clearly, but we don't see people responding back and saying, yes, Holy Spirit, um, I hear you. We don't see that. We see people saying, yes, God, I will serve Christ. But the Holy Spirit, okay, so the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I said to you. The Holy Spirit's mission is to bring the word of God alive to us. He is to bring that word of God that he inspired, that he made happen to bring alive. And what is he bringing alive? The testimony of Jesus. But when the Holy, Holy Spirit, the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father. Now there you go. There is distinction here of person. But the helper, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, comes, whom I, now Jesus is speaking, so whom Jesus shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of himself, testify of Rome, testify of pretty cool concepts, testify of me. So the Holy Spirit will testify and continue to testify about Jesus. He will seek to glorify Jesus and bring to remembrance everything about Jesus. I still have many things to say to you, John 16, 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, notice he says he, this was a big deal for a certain church that repented of their belief that they thought that the Holy Spirit was a force. And they couldn't argue with the Greek here. This one verse put them over the edge and they repented and then believed in the triunity of God. It's a church of God something, I forgot. And some of them uh, broke off from even them. But Hank Hanegraaff worked with them and helped them see this. And they looked at this Greek and they said, the Holy Spirit is not a force. He is person. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. Again, he does not speak about himself. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things to come. So now we have, he's talking about the New Testament being written, basically. New Testament is going to be written. He will glorify me. Who will he glorify? 
not himself. He will glorify Jesus, for he will take what is of mine, or what is mine, and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. From the Father to the Son. And then the Son is glorified by the Holy Spirit. And everything that the Son has that was given to him by the Father, the Holy Spirit will declare it and explain it and disclose it to us. And that is the truth. I don't understand how that works within who he is. I accept what he says. There's something about God being infinite, eternal, having no beginning or end that my mind already has problems with. But here, think about this. Personhood. Explain that to me in detail. I can't explain personhood. I can't explain my wife. I accept her. I know her. I know things about her. There's things about her that I, you know, I just accept. Same with her to me. And she's still trying to figure me out, and I'm still trying to figure it. You know, that is personhood. In that same way, how do you try to define God in some academic way? I mean, I, I try to explain some things here. But really, what I'm doing is presenting the truth that we are to accept. And how does it change us? Or how, do, how should we respond? So if they've seen that the Holy Spirit's mission is about glorifying Christ, exalting Christ, and that God through his disciples would lift up Christ, that is, his Holy Spirit through us. See, his mission is to do this. If he is in me, my mission is to do this. I, if I'm just a glove, I just do whatever the hand does. And that's kind of what he's talking about here. Not being a robot. But the impetus, my motivation, my the power, the direction, what I'm doing, all that I'm about should be all that the Holy Spirit is about in me as he directs me to serve Christ. And again, it doesn't need to be reiterated, but it does. The Holy Spirit never brings attention to himself. If there's a ministry out there that talks a lot about the Holy Spirit and all that he does and everything, I, I kind of wonder... I kind of wonder about that ministry, about those teachers and teachings and prophets and apostles, that they glorify the Holy Spirit so much that somewhere Jesus gets lost in the shuffle. So if the Holy Spirit is working in my life, his sanctifying power is working in me, he is not making me more like the Holy Spirit. His mission is to make me more like Christ. Do you see, God's Holy Spirit is all about Jesus. God's Holy Spirit is only recorded in Scripture about what he did, just so that we understand who he is. But then he wants to quietly be behind the scene doing things to exalt Christ. The Holy Spirit, the servant spirit, the spirit of holiness is to lift up Christ. Everything that is about the spirit of the living God is about Jesus. So I kind of wonder if those other ministries are filled maybe with another spirit, exalting another Jesus, proclaiming a different gospel. 2 Corinthians 11, Paul has a lot to say about another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit. Galatians chapter 1. If anybody comes along and preaches a different gospel, I will say that if that person is proclaiming a different Christ, they have a different spirit, they will be proclaiming a different gospel. There's a lot of different gospels out there. It may not be the gospel of the biblical Christ, God in human flesh. Interesting. What jumps out at us is holy. The Holy Spirit. Do you ever notice that? Real Holy Spirit. If he's holy, he will move in my life, in your life, in our lives, to make us more holy. 
not in our actions that we somehow, in our behaviors that we somehow try to conform ourselves to, but God the Holy Spirit himself works in us to make us holy. Part of that is to lead us into doctrinal truth. He is also the spirit of truth. He is not the spirit of error. So a person who is really filled with the Holy Spirit will never, ever be led by the Holy Spirit into doctrinal error. A person might do it themselves, resisting the Holy Spirit, grieving the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit himself, God lead me by your Spirit. If you say that and you are really meaning that and you are surrendered to him, he will never lead you into doctrinal error. He will always lead you into doctrinal truth, purity of doctrine. And he will always attempt to lead us away from heresies. So a person may get caught in that, and it's true. We, otherwise, why would there be warnings for Christians? There's a, I mean, there's warnings all over about false prophets, false teachers. A person who is truly born again can be caught into that. But God, the Holy Spirit, the whole time will be trying, attempting to pull that person out. Don't get there to a place where you are grieving the Holy Spirit. I've read 1 John, and it says there is a, there is a sin unto death. And as C.S. Lewis says, God may want to unbody you. He may say, I have to bring this one home. And that can happen. So the warning is there. Stay away from doctrinal error. But 1 John 4 1 through 6 says God's Spirit will lead you to test the spiritual teaching that's out there against his word. We are commanded. It is our duty to test it. And God's Spirit will lead us into truth because God said so. Jesus said so. His Spirit will lead us into all the truth. And all that truth will always confirm the word of God. Always. Now, I'm getting close to the end here. I'm trying to land but there's a lot to who the Holy Spirit is, and we may take this up a little more next week too. It's worth it to understand who God is in our lives. He is the Spirit of life. That name itself should bring encouragement to us. When all hope and everything around us is drawing death in our lives, it is speaking death. There's death everywhere. We've had that this week, this last Wednesday. That the message was death. The message was discouragement. The message was give up, give in, go away, stop living your life as Christians. And the spirit of life, the dynamic spirit of life, he is more powerful than all that Satan's onslaughts would come against us. His his life is here to encourage us. As that Ezekiel passage says, he will cause us to walk in his ways. He will move in us. His spirit will live in us. Spirit of life is more powerful than the spirit of sin and death. Romans 8 opens up with that. The spirit of life in Christ is more powerful than the spirit of sin and of death. So God's spirit being in us he brings us alive, even when everything, even our own thoughts, want to bring us down. He brings us back to life. That is an encouragement to us, that that name, the spirit of life. So in the hard circumstances that God sends our way, always remember, God is using those things to change us to be more like Jesus. And that is usually how God works in our lives, in the sanctifying process. His Holy Spirit working in us to become more like Jesus. And we're going to look at that a little more next week. We're going to look at how God uses everything for his glory. And we know some scriptures like that. Romans 8, 28. Many of us quote that. And we'll look in that, into that. That's part of God's sanctifying process. Part of his sovereign work of sanctifying us, his predestinating us to glory in Christ is all part of that. So that is an encouragement, even though it seems like 
Satan is winning. God says Satan is not winning, but God may even use what Satan is doing to change us. That which Satan intended for evil, God intends for good in our lives. Amen? So as we think about who Jesus is, remember God the Holy Spirit is the one working in our lives to make us focus on Jesus. God the Holy Spirit will want us to worship the Lamb who was slain. Amen? So let's stand and let's worship God with this last song.